Welcome to the session on 10 simple ways to manage aphids naturally. Who here has had problems with aphids? Probably everyone's had problems with aphids. I know I have them on all sorts of plants. So if you've ever had issues with yellowing leaves and you have strolled through your garden and you start to see your plants are kind of declining, they may be stunting, and then you turn over those leaves and you see a massive outbreak of aphids. Has any of you ever dealt with that before? I know I have. It's almost like a surprise. It's like how does a million aphids come all at once? It's crazy. So I'm gonna give you some simple solutions that will help you with your aphid problem. And as a plant doctor, I always use an integrated approach to control aphids. And I'm gonna tell you some things that have worked for me and sometimes I don't even see aphids because it is controlling it so well. So what do you expect to see when you see aphids? So aphids, if you haven't seen them before or, or didn't know what they were, they're pear-shaped and they have these two little tailpipes coming out. They're kind of cute, I think. Well, they're very tiny. They could be all sorts of colors. There's yellow, black, green, white. They have even some woolly ones but they affect a lot of different vegetables. So I, I kind of call them my, the plant, plant sucking vampires of the plant world because they just suck the juices right out of the plant. They can also cause a lot of other issues. They cause stunted growth, distorted leaves, yellowing leaves. They can also transmit viruses. It's one of the first things I look for when I see some kind of mosaic on my plants is that do I have aphids? Maybe they transmitted some viruses because a lot of them do. It's within the, the saliva it goes into the leaves as they're sucking. Some of that saliva goes in there and can transmit the viruses. You may have seen some of this black stuff on your leaves. Who here has seen some sooty mold on their leaves when it comes to some of these plant sucking insects? They, and the reason for city mold, and that's what this black stuff is, is that aphids produce honeydew. So that's a fancy way of saying aphid poop. It's the sugary substance that ants love to eat. I'll talk about ants a little bit later. And it's a source of food for city mold. So city mold is not a disease that you should cure. It's actually just a symptom of having aphids. A lot of people want to cure it with some kind of fungicide and that's not the way to go. Some problems with the sunny mold is it's, it's really ugly, but also it being black, it, it does cover up the, the chlorophyll that absorbs, for, absorbs light for photosynthesis. So that can be a problem. So what vegetables do aphids infest? The better thing I should say is what vegetables don't aphids infest? <laughs> but uh, they infest cabbage and cruciferous crops. Earlier in the season, I saw them on my radishes pretty heavily. They also, they get your lettuces and salad greens, your beans and peas, peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, and as well as some of our flowers, like sunflowers, roses, I see some on my hibiscus and fruit trees. They actually have one called green peach aphid. So they infest a lot of different things and the problem with that is that a lot of times you see aphids without wings so in that picture you can see the aphids don't have wings but there are some that are winged so in the population they will produce a few winged ones and that will cause them to you know fly off to the next plant so they can start a population of their own why is it important to manage aphids quickly well you can see in that picture it's kind of hard because it's green but aphids are born pregnant. They ha go through something called parthenogenesis, so they're born pregnant and they can produce up to 12 aphids per day. So that can grow into a large colony very quickly. So if you see them and then you're like, two weeks later you decide to manage them, the population, you're, you might have to just pull up that plant. So how do you monitor for aphids? The best thing to do is to scout early and scout often. So check your plants daily if you can. So flip over those leaves because they're underneath the leaves. You, you may see some symptoms on tops like some yellowing or stunting, but by that time you have a pretty large infestation. So when they're small, you might not actually see a whole lot of symptoms. So you flip over those leaves. They like the new growth. 
because that's the sweetest for them. It has the most amount of sugars in it. You need to manage that population when it was when it's small. You can also, if you want to kind of cheat a little, you can use yellow sticky traps. They are attracted to yellow. So, and you can buy sticky traps or you can make your own using a yellow plate or spray paint it and put some Vaseline on it. Uh, they also have some sticky substance called Tanglefoot that you can buy and you can spread it on there. You could have a block of wood, all you have to scrape it off and put new stuff on there. You just have the yellow sticky trap over the foliage and then you can see when those flying aphids are coming in and you know you have a problem. So that's an easy way to monitor it and it also captures those, those flying aphids. So the big thing I'm talking about here is how to manage aphids. So I'm going to talk about using integrated pest management. So we're going to go over different strategies that goes through preventing them, cultural controls, which means modifying the habit, habit and doing best management practices, physical controls, biological using natural enemies, as well as chemical. And we're going to stick with the biorational pesticides, not go to the conventional pesticides, because we're going to try to do this all naturally and organic. So I'm going to focus on those techniques. And there's actually a few more than 10, but 10 is always a good number. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is adding plants to repel aphids. So this is often called companion planting, where you add plants that will help benefit other plants surrounding it. So in this case, when it comes to repelling aphids, you stick with strong smelling plants like marigolds, catnip, dill, fennel, cilantro, peppermint, chives, and garlic that will help repel these aphids. You do have to get them like right next to the plant in order for it to work. So if you have one in one bed and then expect it to work in the other bed, it's not going to work. And the benefit of these is they're also pollinator plants. I have some marigolds all over the place. Every bed has marigolds in it. And I see tons of different wasps and bees going to my marigolds, which is great because it adds in that pollination. And I can tell you my tomatoes were, are just exploding with fruit because of all those bees. And yes, tomatoes are self-pollinating and don't need the bees, but the bees do help. Often when it comes to companion plants, you don't really know it's working because it's a lack of pests. So I had a lot of aphid problems in the winter. I'm in Florida, so growing in the winter is pretty common for me. But I did not have my marigolds growing at the time. And I had tons and tons of aphid problems. And I was using a lot of insecticidal soaps and stuff. But in the spring, I, I started a bunch of marigolds and put marigolds everywhere. And plants that really get a lot of aphids, like my okra, they don't have any aphids. And that tells me that the marigolds are working. They are stinky, goodness. But they're not attracted to my okra because of those marigolds. So that's a success. So a lack of pests can be a success. And a lot of times we don't see that. We see the reactive where you need to control the aphids. But using plants that's just a win-win because you are keeping them from coming to your garden in the first place so another way of having plants that will help the garden is to trap them with sacrificial plants and i've heard a few different things when it comes to sacrificial plants uh, i usually call them trap crops but these are crops or plants that are more attractive to the pest than the plant you want to save and in this case, uh, examples would be nasturtiums, uh, calendula, and nettles. And what you would do, because there's so many aphids, instead of trying to spray them to kill them, you would just remove the plant. So it would be a sacrifice. So this is a, an easy way to control aphids before they come in. The key is that they need to be around the perimeter of the garden, not all inside of the garden, because you want to kind of trap them out of the garden so that it should be the first thing that they come to because if they come if they come into the garden and then they find the tomato first then they they'll probably go to the tomato and you can see a picture there of nasturtiums that has aphids all over the back of them so this is something that's usually done early in the season is to use floating row covers to keep aphids out and so there's lots of things we call floating row covers but in this case this is a an insect netting that is used to keep it out because 
some netting like bird netting it, the holes are just too big for things like aphids so you can use an insect netting to keep the aphids out and this is especially good for really vulnerable plants also once when they're pretty small tomatoes that get really really large that might be difficult to do and it's best to do this early in the season because uh, it can hold humidity and heat so depending on where you are in florida we don't use these very often because it gets hot pretty much in february sometimes but these can be quite effective in keeping not only aphids out but a whole bunch of other different pests so this is a cultural control method to not over fertilize your plants and why is it important not to over fertilize your plants well aphids part of their biology is they're they're sucking sugars out of the leaves and nitrogen causes this nice lush new growth to appear and aphids just attack it like crazy so if you add a lot of nitrogen to your plants if you're sticking some quick release fertilizer out in a large amount you're going to have yes you're going to have lots and lots of growth and you're going to be very happy it's all nice and green but those aphids are going to be like lunch so it's best to if you're going to use a quick release fertilizer is to do it in small amounts and do it over time so that it can get a little bit of food at a time or the other strategy you can use is to use organic fertilizers and organic fertilizers in and itself are slow release because microorganisms need to break them down in order to be in the form that plants use so the fifth strategy is to make sure your plants are watered well when it comes to plants in general the more stress your plants are under the more pests they're going to have same with diseases and so you have to make sure you're not stressing out your plants and one way to do that i talked about fertilizer fertilizing it correctly don't under fertilize it don't over fertilize it but also make sure it's watered and not too dry because if it's too dry aphids really like this because once the plant dries out a little bit the the sugars get concentrated think about having uh boiling down sugar uh in a pot and you reduce the moisture it gets more and more concentrated and then turns into caramel yum so that's what happens when your plants are under a drought so if they get too dry if you're not watering them enough you just oh you see them well oh okay i need to water them then aphids sense the chemicals and be be attracted to that i use a simple moisture beater but it's just it turns a color blue when it's wet and white when it's dry so right now i have it in one of my uh, potted terracotta pots uh, one of them because that one dries out a lot and it lets me know when it's too dry so it's a great way to to know if your plants are too dry i also use this drip irrigation so the system i use in particular because i do square foot gardening is what you can see in the picture and this is from garden in minutes this is their um, watering grid which is great because it just streams water out and i i do it twice a day because of the heat but it allows for my plants to be watered enough and it, it gives it gets it right to the roots before i had this i had a lot of problems and, and that's why in the winter i had a lot of aphids and a lot of pest problems and yeah you do need to keep track of of the rain i haven't even been turning on my my watering grid because of the rain um we have a lot of summer rains here so it's also important not to over irrigate and that's not due to the aphids that's more to do to diseases so we don't want to go the other route and then get root rot and then our plants die from that so another strategy that you can do is to remove aphids physically this is often through a stream of water using the hose it's enough pressure to be able to knock those aphids off and you're like well why don't they just crawl back up well aphids little legs are just a little too weak to crawl back up to where they need to go so by spraying them they're gonna die from lack of food because they they just can't climb up onto those plants again so if you keep spraying them and knocking it off then you'll reduce the population and hopefully another strategy may help like biological control natural enemies although this doesn't work for all plants some plants the leaves are a little too delicate so you do need to kind of test that if you spray the water on like a leaf and then that leaf dies then mm, probably not best strategy just try to spray um spray off all these aphids you can use a little brush to kind of wipe them off yes that's usually 
kind of reserved for house plants but you can you could do it for your vegetables as well this is my favorite i love seeing beneficial insects out in my garden and the big thing with beneficial insects is making sure you know that they're there being able to identify them i put together a few pictures here of some common ones that you may not have noticed i didn't stick a ladybug adult on there because yeah everyone knows what a ladybug looks like but the larvae is a little different looking it doesn't look like the normal ladybug so some things you could do is to is to plant certain flowers around your garden that will attract these natural enemies a lot of the adults adults of like lace wings and hoverflies i call them surfeit flies they need nectar so it will attract them to those plants and then they will find the aphids they will lay eggs where the aphids are so we can see here the lacewing larvae that's a pretty common one you may see the eggs it's like a hair with a little egg attached to it i've seen them attached to cars before but i have seen them attached to leaves and i made sure that they were not disturbed when i would see those there's the flowers i, I put a list in there dill queen anne's lace cosmos Black-eyed Susan, Lantana, Basil, and I'm sure there's more that you can plant in your garden to help attract these beneficial insects. Another one that most people don't no normally notice is if you see your aphids all puffed up, look like little balls, then they have been parasitized by wasps, but they're little tiny wasps. And so if you see that, you have beneficial insects. So that's great. Let them do their work some other things is you can purchase some of these like ladybugs lacewing eggs you can do the aphid mummies as well i just didn't find them on amazon um, and there's a few others that you can purchase follow the directions and not all of them are gonna live just gotta say that so when it comes to ladybugs if it's daytime and the sun is shining they are going to fly away that is their purpose in life is as soon as you open up it's going to be like a butterfly release and they're just going to fly away so you do it at sunset because they, they don't fly over 85 degrees so you do it when the when the temperature's cooler and miss the plants because you have to give them a water source they're pretty thirsty when they come out of those containers so you give them a water source you do it later in the day and hope that they stay and eat your aphids so that's what happens with ladybugs there's certain things when it comes to each of these that you got to follow those directions and if you do see them don't spray pesticides even things like soaps and oils and neem oil all that stuff will kill your beneficial insects so if you see them let them do their job maybe try to spray them with water to get rid of some of the population because they can only work so fast so number eight use insecticidal soap and or neem to kill aphids naturally there are a lot of things that will kill aphids but um, insecticidal soap is one of those that i use pretty often i haven't had as much success with the ones you purchase i i think it degrades a little bit so i do like to make my own i put a little recipe in there for insecticidal soap with a neem boost that has worked for me so what soaps and oils do is they will disrupt that cellular membrane and it kind of suffocates them neem oil which is always a fan favorite neem oil will disrupt its growth it also deters feeding it repels them and there's all kinds of things that neem oil does but there's different versions of neem oil so there's neem oil extract which is the common one that you'll see mixed in with the the uh, ready to use soap the problem i find with that is that it doesn't work <laughs> and the reason it doesn't work is because neem oil degrades very quickly and also the extract extract doesn't have a, as much of the active ingredient compared to the concentrated cold pressed neem oil so what i do is i'll make up a little soap solution and then i'll take a portion of that add some cold pressed neem oil and it's not very expensive so i have some and i will add a teaspoon of that to it and then use that and then it's in its pure it's in its concentrated most active form and you don't store it because if you store it it's, it's just going to break down with the soap and everything some notes for this is to not spray over 85 85 seems to be the gold number for lots of different things it will burn your leaves if you do 
I live in Florida, so you know, I have to be very conscious of that. So you do it late, late in the evening time once the temperature goes down. Neem oil and insecticidal soap can affect beneficials, so if you see them, try to avoid where they are so you don't kill those off as well. Number nine, we're getting closer to the end of the list here, is the dust with diatomaceous earth. So diatomaceous earth is fossilized remains of these aquatic organisms called diatoms. And what they do is they have like razor sharp edges, edges. It's a little dusty powder, as you can see in the picture here. And it will cut through their waxy layer. It will dry them out. And it works on a bunch of different things. It works on slugs. It works on um, roly polies, uh, earwigs, ants, eh, kind of. You want to use food grade diatomaceous earth. There is also a pool version. Don't go cheap and try to get the pool version. You need that food grade version. And what you're going to do is you're going to dust it on the stems and the leaves where the aphids are. You're not going to do it like that with the shovel. No, 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 don't do it. You want to use a little duster for it because you need to get where those aphids are. It's they're under the leaves. You're not going to just waste all that product and like practically bathe them in it. And the key thing about diatomaceous earth is it washes away pretty easily. Even humidity can cause it to wash away. So if your, your aphids still aren't controlled and it's rained, you need to reapply it because it's not sticking around. It's just a dust. Lastly is manage ants on plants. I know you were waiting for me to talk about ants because aphids and ants just kind of go together like peanut butter and jelly. Because ants farm aphids. Yes, like cattle. And they protect them from predators like shepherds. Yes, because that is their food. The honeydew is their food, actually, not the aphids, we wish. But the honeydew, the sweet stuff, is their food. And they will actually, you know, sip it from the, from the booties of uh, aphids sometimes. So you can control the ants to, re to let the beneficial insects do their job. Because what they'll do, those ants will chase those beneficial insects away and a nice thing is the same stuff that works on aphids work on ants. So soaps, neem oil, diatomaceous earth is all effective on ants. Another thing you can do, which I saw this in the greenhouse recently where I work, is you can wrap the stem of the plant and apply a sticky substance like Tanglefoot. I thought about like a double-sided tape, but I don't think that's sticky enough to hold ants. So they'll probably just walk over that. So you can see in that picture there, is a tomato plant that has some tangle foot on it on probably a, a wrap that was bought for that. That tomato plant actually had mealy bugs, but it had a lot of ants. It's same, you know, same thing works for aphids as well. So in summary, is that aphids are sap sucking vampires that need to be controlled while the populations are small uh, because they can get out of hand. But you can do it. You can control these aphids. So expect that they are going to be there and plan for it. Plant these marigolds, have products on hand, and use multiple strategies. Use integrated pest management, IPM, to be able to control your aphids, and then you'll be able to maximize your harvest, grow more veggies, and be happy with gardening and not want to quit.